Okay, hi. So I want to read this cool case in the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, Animal Legal Defense Fund et al., Plaintiffs Appellees versus Lawrence G. Wasden, Defendant Appellant, United States District Court, District of Idaho, Honorable V. Lynn Windmill, case number 1-14-CV-00104-BLW, dash dash brief of a meek Amici Curiae, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press and 22 media organizations in support of plaintiff ap appellees. Bruce Brown, Council of Record, Greg Leslie, Michael Lambert, Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, 1156 15th Street, Northwest Suite, 1250, Washington, D.C., 2005, 202s, let's see. Okay, table of contents. Ooh, okay. So I'm going to um, go through the argument summaries. Idaho's ag-gag statute infringes on the First Amendment rights of journalists who want to inform the public about food safety. Investigators, investigations by journalists into agricultural facilities have long played a vital role in ensuring food safety. Idaho's ag-gag statute chills future investigations into the agricultural industry. The First Amendment protects speech on matters of public concern by subject restrictions to strict scrutiny, which is not satisfied by this statute. Speech on matters of public concern in which the public has a right to know, including through audio and video recordings, warrants the highest degree of protection. Idaho's ag-gag statute is content-based restriction on speech that does not survive strict scrutiny. Okay, certificate of compliance, blah, 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 blah. Table of authorities, oh my gosh, it's huge. ACLU of Illinois v. Alvarez, City of Renton v. Playtime Theater, City of San Diego v. Rowe, Connick v. Myers, Dunn v. And Bradstreet v. Green, Green Moss Builders, ETW Corp v. Jure Publications, Garrett Garrison v. State of Louisiana, Grosjean American, v. American Press Co., Klein, Klendienst v. Mandel, Martin v. City of Struthers, Miami Herald Publication v. Tornillo, Mills v. Alabama, Minneapolis Star and Tribune, versus Minnesota <laughs> Commissioner of Revenue, NAACP v. Button, NAACP v. Claiborne Hardware, New York Times v. Sullivan, 1964, RAV v. City of St. Paul, Reed v. Town of Gilbert, Roth v. United States, Felsen v. CBS Inc., Turner Broadcasting Systems v. FCC, United States v. Alvarez, United States v. Stevens, Virginia State Building and Pharmacy v. the Virginia Citizens Consumer Council. And this is regarding statutes in Idaho code. I'm thinking this Idaho code annotated 184801, 187008, 187011. These are 2014 laws, 1870-42, and then 9338-2011. Other authorities, um, 113 Congressional Record, 2001 Investigative Reporting, the Pulitzer Prizes, 2010 Explanatory Reporting, the Pulitzer Prizes, Continuing Problems in USDA's Enforcement of Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, Hearing Before the Subcommittee on Domestic Policy of House uh, Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, 2010, Food Safety Agricultural Factbook, USDA, James Diedrich, The Jungle, <laughs> Encyclopedia of Chicago, and uh, Dirk and Keating and James R. Grossman, James O'Shea, Raking the Muck, <laughs> the 2008 Pulitzer Prize winners investigative reporting the Pulitzer Prizes, Wallace F. Jansen, The Story of Laws Behind the Labels, Food and Drug Administration. Okay, so here we go. Pursu okay, Rule 29C5 certification. Pursuant to Federal Rule uh, APP P 29C5, Amici State states that no party's counsel authored this brief in whole or in part. No party or party's counsel contributed money that was intended to fund preparing or submitting this brief, and no person other than the Amici, their members, or their counsel contributed money that was intended to fund preparing or submitting the brief. Corporate disclosure statements. The parties to this amicus brief are the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, American Society of News Editors, Association of Alternative News Media, California Newspaper Publishers Association, Californians Aware, Dow Jones and Company, Inc., 
the E.W. Scripps Company, First Look Media Works, Inc., Freedom of the Press Foundation, Idaho Press Club, the Idaho Statesman, International Dem Documentary Association, Investigative Reporting Workshop at American University, the Media Consortium, MPA, Association of Magazine Media, the National Press Club, the National Press Photographers Association, Online News Association, Pan American Center, Radio Television Digital News Association, Society of Professional Journalists, Student Press Law Center, and Tully Center for Free Speech. Pursuant to Federal Rule at P261, Amici disclose as follows. The Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press is an unincorporated association of re reporters hmm, and editors with no parent corporation and no stock. American Society of News Editors is a private non-stock corporation that has no parent. Association of Alternative News Media has no parent corporation and does not issue any stock. California Newspaper Pub Publishers Association is a mutual benefit corporation organized under state law for the purpose of promoting and preserving the newspaper industry in California. California Inspiration, a publicly held company, is the indirect parent corporation of Dow Jones. Ruby Newco LLC, a subsidiary of News Corporation and non-publicly held company, is the direct parent of Dow Jones. No publicly held company directly owns 10% or more of the stock of Dow Jones. The E.W. Scripps Company is a publicly traded company with no parent company. No individual stockholder owns more than 10% of its stock. First Look Media Works, Inc. is a nonprofit, non-stock corporation organized under the laws of Delaware, no publicly held corporation holds an interest of 10% or more in First Look Media Works, Inc. Freedom of the Press Foundation does not have a parent, cor parent corporation and no publicly held corporation. Firebox, go away. Let's see. No publicly held corporation holds an interest of 10% more in First Look Media Works, Inc. Freedom of the Press Foundation does not have a parent corporation and no publicly held corporation owns 10% or more of the stock of the organization. The Idaho Press Club is a not-for-profit corporation that has no parent company and issues no stock. The Idaho Statesman Publishing, LLC, the Idaho Statesman, is owned by the McClatchy Company, which has no parent corporation, but is publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol MNI. Contrarious Investment Management Limited owns 10% or more of the stock of the McClatchy Company. The International Documentary Association is a non-for-profit organization with no parent corporation and no stock. The investigative reporting workshop is a privately funded nonprofit news organization affiliated with the American University School of Communication in Washington. It issues no stock. The media consortium has no parent corporation and no stock. MPA, the Association of Magazine Media, has no parent companies and no publicly held company owns more than 10% of its stock. The National Press Club is a not-for-profit corporation that has no parent company and issues no stock. The National Press Photographers Association is a 501 C6 nonprofit organization with no parent company. It issues no stock and does not own any of the parties or Amicus's stock. Online News Association is not for profit organization. It has no parent corporation and no publicly traded corporation owns 10% more of stock. Pan American Center has no parent or affiliate corporation. Radio Television Digital News Association is a nonprofit organization that has no parent company and issues no stock. Society of Professional Journalists is a non-stock corporation with no parent company. Student Press Law Center is a 501c3 not-for-profit corporation that has no parent and issues no stock. The Tilly Center for Free Speech is a subsidiary of Syracuse University. Source of authority to file brief. Pursuant to Federal Rule App 29A, all parties to this appeal have given consent for Amici to file this brief. See also Ninth Circuit Advisory Committee note to Rule 29.3. Statement of interest of Amici Curiae. Amici, all of whom are engaged in news gathering or represent the interests of journalists and publishers, have an interest in ensuring that reliable resources are available to them so that they may gather the news in a way that benefits the public and serves as a watch watchdog on the agriculture industry. The Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press is joined in this brief by the American Society of News Editors, Association of Alternative News Media, California Newspaper Publishers Association, California Where, Dow Jones and Company, Inc., the E.W. Scripps Company, First Look Media Works, Inc., Freedom of the Press Foundation, Idaho Press Club, the Idaho Statesman, International Documentary Association, Investigative Reporting Workshop at American University, the Media Consortium, MPA, the Association of Magazine Media, the National Press Club, the National Press Photographers Association, Online News Association, Pan American Center, 
Radio, Television, Digital News Association, Society of Professional Journalists, Student Press Law Center, and Tully Center for Free Speech. Descriptions of all parties to this brief are given more fully in Appendix A. Introduction. Amici filing in support of plaintiffs at Police Animal Legal Defense Fund, ALDF, urged this court to affirm the district court's order granting ADLF's motion for summary judgment. The district court properly found Idaho Code and it, let's see, in 18742, known as Idaho's Ag-Gag statute, unconstitutional under the First and Fourteenth Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Amici write to stress the First Amendment concerns of the news media if the statute is allowed to remain in effect. Summary of argument. By criminalizing audio and video recording at agricultural facilities, the Idaho Ag-Gag statute weakens food safety while stifling free speech. Journalists and whistleblowers who serve as their sources have long been credited with advancing the safety of the food that the public consumes, and while federal inspections have drastically improved the safety of food in the past century, problems within the inspection system leave a gap in food safety that journalists and others have filled. The Idaho statute poses a substantial risk of criminalizing lawful and constitutionally protected news gathering activity and chilling the very journalism that has previously led to positive changes in a healthier food supply. Amici also emphasized the importance of protecting speech of public concern criminalized by the statute. The public has a right to receive pertinent information about the treatment of animals, the environmental impact of the agricultural agriculture industry, and the safety of employees and the public food supply. Furthermore, Idaho's ag-gag statute is content-based restriction that does not survive strict scrutiny. The law targets speech based on, on communicative content, namely recording the conduct of an agricultural production facilities operation, Idaho Code Annotated 187042 1D 2014. The state's proffered interests in protecting property rights are not compelling, and the law is not narrowly tailored. Thus, as the district court correctly concluded, Idaho's ag-gag statute should be struck down as unconstitutional under the First Amendment. Argument. Idaho's ag-gag statute infringes on the First Amendment rights of journalists who want to inform the public about food safety. Idaho's ag-gag statute conflicts with the principle that the First Amendment protects and even encourages the press to act as a watchdog and challenge the status quo. The Idaho statute criminalizes journalistic actions that have previously led to positive social change and chills the same type of investigative reporting in the future. As the U.S. Supreme Court has found, the Constitution specifically selected the press to play an important role in the discussion of public affairs. Mills v. Alabama, 384 U.S. 214 219, 1966. The founders envisioned the press as a means to freely challenge authority without government restraint. See Roth, the United States, 30, 354 U.S., 476, 484, 1957. The protections given speech and press was fashioned to assure unfettered interchange of ideas for the bringing about of political and social changes desired by the public. Minneapolis Star and Tribune, Co Minnesota Committee versus Minnesota Committee Commissioner of Revenue, 460 U.S. 575, 585, 1983, quoting Gross Jean versus American Press Co., 297 U.S., 233, 250, 1936. An untrammeled press is a vital source of public information, and an informed public is the essence of a working democracy. Quoting Thomas Jefferson, the court wrote that where the press is free, every man able to read, all is safe. Miami Herald Public, uh, Publication Co. versus Tornillo, 418 U.S. 241, 260, 1974. Further, any other system that would supplant private control of the press with the heavy hand of government intrusion would make the government the censor of what the people may read and know. It, this... The Idaho statute does specifically what the court warns against. It grants the government control over the press and censors information to be disseminated to the public. Criminalizing journalism on food and agriculture safety limits the press from investigating and questioning the food industry. Where it should be extending the leash, the Idaho government instead muzzles the watchdog. Investigations by journalists into agricultural facilities have long played a vital role in ensuring food safety. The watchdog role of the press in protecting the public's interest in a safe food supply and the conditions under which that food is produced has a long and time-honored history. Upton Sinclair's famous 1906 expose on Chicago slaughterhouses, The Jungle, and his contemporaries' works were among the early works of investigative journalism. See James O'Shea raking the muck, 
Chicago Tribune, May 21, 2006, available at HDTV. Okay, although his novel is centered around a, a fictitious Lithuanian immigrant, Sinclair conducted his extensive research, interviewing health inspectors and workers and going undercover into the meatpacking facilities to witness the unsanitary conditions firsthand. James Diedrich, The Jungle, Encyclopedia of Chicago, Janice Il Reef, and Durkin Keating, and James R. Grossman, 2005, available at Encyclopedia of Chicago, history.org. Sinclair's work is credited with aiding passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act and Meat Inspection Act, both enacted in 1906, which instituted vigorous reforms in the meatpacking industry. See also Wallace B. Jansen, The Story of Laws Behind the Labels, Food and Drug Administration, FDA.gov, about FDA, What We Do, History Overviews. Okay. Originally published in FDA Consumer, June 81, a single chapter in Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, precipitated legislation expanding federal meat regulation to provide continuous inspection of all red meats for interstate distribution, a far more rigorous type of control than that provided by the Pure Food Bill. The type of reform that followed publication of The Jungle has repeated itself numerous times in history that followed. In the late 1960s, Nick Cotts, reporter for the Minneapolis Tribune, with a series of stories revealing widespread unsanitary conditions in the in the country's meatpacking plants. 113 Congressional Record 2283-86-1967. His investigative reporting contributed to the passage of the Meat Inspection Act of 1967, which extended the reach of federal regulation to cover not only meat that cross state borders, but all slaughterhouses and meat processing facilities in the United States at uh, 21283. During a congressional, rec a congressional session leading to the passage of the act, Senator Walter Mondale thanked Cots for bringing the issue to Congress's attention, saying the press must take a major share of the credit for action in this area. Cots and a number of journalists have since won Pulitzer Prizes for their reporting on such issues. Tony Horowitz of the Wall Street Journal won the prize in 1995 for stories about working conditions for low-wage workers, including an article on the dangers facing workers at poultry facilities that he reported on while employed at two such places. See the 1995 prize winner in national reporting. Uh, Pulitzer.org winners, Tony Horowitz. Uh, Michael Moss of the New York Times won in 2010 for calling into question the effectiveness of injecting ammonia into beef to remove E. coli. Explanatory reporting, the Pulitzer Prizes, uh, Pulitzer.org archives 8819. Numerous others, such as David Willman with the Los Angeles Times, who reported on the missteps of the Food and Drug Administration in improving the diabetes pill Resulin, have won Pulitzer Prizes for the investigative reporting on consumer safety and federal regulatory oversight. C2001 investigative reporting the Pulitzer Prizes, Pulitzer.org archives dash uh, slash 6487. The 2008 Pulitzer Prize winners investigative reporting Pulitzer Prizes citation. Okay. Awarding the prize to the Chicago Tribune staff for reporting on faulty government regulation of toys, car seats, and cribs resulting in the extensive recall of hazardous products and congressional action to tighten supervision. And New York Times reporters for their stories on toxic ingredients in medicine and other everyday products imported from China leading to crackdowns by American and Chinese officials. The government's inspection system itself is often flawed, which makes independent observation and verification even more important. At times, inspection teams are short-staffed and inspectors can be undermined by their supervisors or choose to turn a blind eye to problems. See generally continuing problems in USDA's Enforcement of the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. Hearing before Subcommittee on Domestic Policy, House uh, Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, Woman, uh, 111th Congress, 2010. USDA Inspector Dean Wyatt repeatedly reported abuse at a Vermont facility he observed, and rather than taking action against the plant, his supervisors demoted and reprimanded him. It is uh, 38 to 39. They told him to drastically reduce the amount of time spent on humane handling enforcement because he was finding too many problems. Many of the people and organizations at the center of unveiling problems within the food industry were eventually praised by government bodies. The White House invited reporter Nick Kotz to Washington, D.C. for his investigative journalism that led to the passage of the Meat Inspection Act of 1967, O'Shea. However, by passing the Ag-Gag statute, the Idaho legislature 
directors have punished rather than praised those seeking to uncover issues in the food and agriculture industry. Idaho's ag gag statute, B, Idaho's ag gag statute chills future investigations into the agriculture industry. The Idaho statute is certain to have a chilling effect on future speech because the law journalists who pursue the types of investigations that lead to beneficial changes in the food industry will have to be excessively cautious in their actions for fear they will be jailed or fined for doing their jobs. If they take steps to ensure they do not violate the broad law in any way, they will miss the story that should be told. The limits this places on news gathering is an improper restriction on speech and diminishes the marketplace of ideas. See Women v. Updegraaf, 344 U.S. 183, 195, 1952, Frankfurter J. concurring, writing that when the government deters First Amendment protected expression, the government has an unmistakable tendency to chill that free play of the spirit of others. Idaho's statute closes off the breathing space the First Amendment needs to survive. NAACP v. Button, 371 U.S. 415, 433, 1963. Journalistic scrutiny of agricultural production facilities can only lead to better food safety. Silencing the speech of journalists and the whistleblowers who act as their sources with the threat of criminal conviction leaves the federal inspection system fraught with its own problems as the lone watchdog over the food of the public food the public consumes. Idaho's statute should be struck down because the government must not discourage journalists from providing the same searching examination of the food industry that has resulted in safer food to the nation for over 100 years. The First Amendment protects speech on matters of public concern by subjecting restrictions to strict scrutiny, which is not satisfied by the statute. Speech on matters of public concern in which the public has a right to know, including through audio and video recordings, warrants the highest degree of protection. Idaho legislators apparently misunderstand the purpose of journalists and other organizations investigating agricultural operations. During a committee hearing, the Idaho Center comparing those seeking to uncover issues within the agricultural industry to terrorists, saying the bill was the way you combat your enemies. In reality, Investigative journalists share the same concerns as state representatives, making sure the American people can safely consume food placed on their dinner tables. In order to guarantee that food safety news reaches the public, the law must safeguard the capturing, dissemination, and receipt of this valuable information. The creation of audio and video recordings is entitled to First Amendment protection. See ACLU of Illinois v. Alvarez. 679 F3D 583 595 7th Circuit 2012. The act of making an audio or audiovisual recording is necessarily included within the First Amendment's guarantee of speech and press rights. As a corollary of the right to disseminate the resulting recording. Wow, Illinois v. Alvarez. ETW Corp v. GRA Publication including 332 F3D 915, 924, Sixth Circuit, 2003. The protection of the First Amendment is not limited to written or spoken words, but includes other mediums of expression, including music, pictures, films, photographs, paintings, drawings, engravings, prints, and sculptures. By barring journalists and their sources from scrutinizing the agricultural industry through audio or video recordings, Idaho Code Annotated 1870. 42, restricts speech of public concern from entering the marketplace of ideas. Speech of public concern lies at the heart of the First Amendment. Done in Bradstreet, Inc. v. Green Moss Builders, Inc. 472 U.S. 749, 758 to 59, 1985, and occupies the highest rung of the hierarchy of First Amendment values. NAACP v. Claiborne Hardware, Co. 458 U.S. 886, 913, 1982. Court protect speech on matters of public concern because freedom to discuss public affairs and public officials is unquestionably the kind of speech the First Amendment was primarily designed to keep within the area of free discussion. New York Times Co. v. Sullivan, 376 U.S. 254-296-97, 1964. Speech of public concern is speech that can be fairly considered as relating to any matter of political, social, or other commentary to the public. Or when it is a subject of general interest and of value and concern to the public. Connick v. Myers, 461 U.S. 138-146-1983, City of San Diego v. Roe, 543 U.S. 7784-2004. In this case, the Idaho ag gag stand the impact of the agricultural agriculture industry on the environment. The agriculture industry 
affects the health of consumers through the safety of the food it produces and the health of employees through workplace conditions. Discussion of public health is clearly valuable speech protected under the First Amendment. C. Spelson v. CBS Inc. 581 F. Soup 1195 1206 N.D. Ill 1984. There may be no more serious or critical issue ex extent today than the health of human beings. Given the frailty of human existence, any controversy on the subject must be afforded wide open discussion and criticism so that individuals may make well-educated healthcare choices. There is also significant community concern regarding the treatment of animals and how the agriculture industry affects the environment. Idaho's attempt to gag these areas of substantial public interest violates the First Amendment's commitment to encouraging speech on matters of public concern. The U.S. Supreme Court has found that the public has a heightened and independent First Amendment right to receive information independent of the speech interests of journalists and other advocates. Where a speaker exists, as is the case here, the protection afforded is to the communication, to its source, and to its recipients both. <sighs> Virginia State Board of Pharmacy versus Virginia Citizens Consumer Council, Inc., 425 U.S. 748-756-1976. Virginia Pharmacy explained that this precept was clear from the decided cases such as Clendies v. Mandel, 408 U.S. 753-762-63-1972, where again the court referred to a broadly accepted right to receive information and ideas, and Martin v. Struthers, 319 U.S. 141 1943, where the court wrote, the authors of the First Amendment knew that novel and unconventional ideas might disturb the complacent, but they chose to encourage a freedom which they believed essential if vigorous enlightenment was ever to triumph over slothful ignorance. This freedom embraces the right to distribute literature and necessarily protects the right to receive it. Great. Martin, 319 U.S. at 143, internal citations omitted, where petitioners have a constitutionally protected interest in communicating with the public. The public has a corresponding constitutional interest in receiving the communications in order to fully re realize its own political freedoms. See Garrison v. State of Louisiana, 379 U.S. 64, 74 to 75, 1964. Speech concerning public affairs is more than self-expression. It is the essence of self-government. Because members of the public cannot themselves monitor all the production facilities that produce their food, they rely on investigative journalists, food safety organizations, federal regulators, and whistleblowers to inform them about the safety of the food they eat. The government should not be allowed to use a statute to censor speech about such an important topic under the First Amendment. Under Idaho's Ag-Gag statute, these journalistic Investigations and publications would be nearly non-existent, and public knowledge of and debate on this matter of concern would be stunted. Idaho's AGCAG statute is a content-based restriction on speech that does not survive strict scrutiny. Content-based restrictions on speech are presumptively unconstitutional under the First Amendment. City of Renton v. Playtime Theater, 475 U.S. 4147, 1986. Governments are prohibited from restricting speech based on its content because content-based laws threaten to manipulate the public debate through coercion rather than persuasion. Turner Broadcasting Systems, Inc. versus FCC, 512 U.S. 622, 641, 1994, and permit governments to drive certain ideas or viewpoints from the marketplace. RAV v. City of St. Paul, 505 U.S. 377, 387, 1982. Content-based laws are only constitutional if they survive strict scrutiny, which requires the laws to be narrowly tailored to serve compelling state interests. Read v. Town of Gilbert, 135 S. Court, 2218-2226-2015. In Read, the United States Supreme Court struck down the Town of Gilbert sign code because it was content-based re regulation. The court defined content-based regulation as those that target speech based on its communicative intent or content. It noted that the common sense meaning of the phrase content-based requires a court to consider whether a regulation of speech on its face draws distinctions based on the message a speaker conveys. Some facial uh, distinctions based on message are obvious, defining regulated speech by particular subject matter, and others are more subtle, defining regulated speech by its function or purpose. Both are distinctions drawn based on the message a speaker conveys and therefore are subject to strict scrutiny. It is clear Idaho's ag-gag statute directly regulates the content of speech. 
Using the U.S. Supreme Court's definition from Reed, Idaho's ag gag statute is content-based because it regulates speech by particular subject matter, namely content, conduct of agricultural production facilities operation, Reed 135 as Supreme Court at 2227 Idaho Code annotated 187042-1D. While the law prohibits speech concerning the operations of an agricultural production facility, the law says nothing about other speech at agricultural production facilities. For example, as the district court explained, recording a private conversation between an agricultural production facility owner and a spouse would not violate the law, while recording animal abuse, a topic of significant public importance, would violate the law. Thus, Idaho's AGAG law is a content-based regulation because it targets speech based on its communicative content. Read 135 Supreme Court at 2226. Accordingly, in order to survive a constitutional challenge, the law must be narrowly tailored to serve compelling state interests. It at 2222. The Idaho government asserts the AGAG statute protects against unwarranted intrusions on legitimate property interests. Def were at 17. However, with respect to the privacy interests of agricultural producers, the government has already done the calculation and decided that food safety requires some intrusion into pub production facilities. Planned operations are highly scrutinized by the federal government, with inspectors regularly visiting the premises, observing observations, testing meat products, and examining livestock. Seafood Safety Agricultural Factbook, USDA 2001 to 2002, USDA.gov Factbook. Chapter 9. Additionally, the owners and operators of agricultural plants are already protected by laws of general applicability from activities that are truly designed to interfere with their operations. Idaho has trespass, conversion, fraud, and defamation laws sufficient to protect those interests and address the acts by individuals or organizations that overstep legal bounds. Idaho Code Annotated 187008, 1870118408801. 2014. Even assuming Idaho's as asserted state interest provides some public benefit, it does not meet the high bar required of content-based law. Content-based regulations have generally been permitted in only a few specifically identi identified categories of speech, including advocacy intended or likely to incite imminent lawless action, obscenity, defamation, speech integral to criminal conduct, fighting words, child pornography, fraud, true threats, and speech that presents a grave and imminent threat, the government has the power to prevent. United States v. Alvarez, 132 Supreme Court, 2537, 2544, 2012, citations omitted. Idaho's proffered interest of protecting property rights certainly does not fall into any of these those categories. No matter the state interest asserted, Idaho's ag-gag statute is not narrowly tailored to be the least restrictive means of achieving these interests. A blanket gag on all image and audio recording of agricultural operations is overly broad and unnecessary, criminalizing a number of constitutionally protected news gathering activities. Though a law may have some valid applications, the court must consider whether it may be overbroad as applied to any given situation, infringing on otherwise protected speech. As the Supreme Court has recognized, we must be aware of the danger of tolerating in the area of First Amendment freedoms the existence of a penal statute susceptible of sweeping and improper application. NAACP v. Button, 371 U.S. 415-432-33-1963. Idaho's AGAG statute is susceptible of precisely that. A plain reading of the statute suggests it criminalizes the recording of crops being sprayed by pesticides. Idaho Code annotated 187042-2A3. Empty fields being Plowed in preparation for planting, 187422 2A2, an old barn being repaired, 187042 2A1, maintenance and repair of agricultural production facility, and perhaps even a home gardener planting tomatoes in his yard, 187042 2A, all planting and growing. An agricultural production facility is essentially defined as any place where agricultural production takes place, even public land, 187. D 42 2B. The statute prohibits anyone from entering an agricultural production facility and making an audio or video recording without the facility owner's express consent. 1870 42 1D. 
There are plenty of scenarios where journalists enter property and record with implied consent or with the consent of someone who is not the owner, and they should not be criminally penalized for it. Under the statute, it is a crime for a reporter to record an interview with an employee, potentially even a manager of a facility, whether it be a meat processing plant, a beekeeping facility, or a plant nursery, because the manager gave consent, but the owner did not. Likewise, it is a crime for a news crew to film the owner spreading seeds in an open field while standing on the edge of the land, even if the owner gave implied consent by willingly answering questions after knowing he was being filmed. It is equally of concern that the statute criminalizes obtaining records of an agricultural production facility by force, threat, misrepresentation, or trespass, 1870-421b, and the statute includes publicly owned operations in the definition of an agricultural production facility, 1870-422b. This means someone who seeks to obtain public records under the state's Public Records Act could apparently be criminally prosecuted if he is accused of misrepresenting himself, perhaps by telling the agency he wants to use the information for personal use, but then publishes it on his blog. Yet the intent of the requester generally should not be a matter under Idaho statute, and officials are, in fact, prohibited from making any inquiry of the requesters except in limited circumstances. Idaho Code Annotated 9338, parentheses 5, 2011. Even if not intended to reach constitutionally protected news gathering, the validity of an overreaching statute cannot be saved by the assumption or even the promise that the government will enforce it narrowly. As the Supreme Court held in its con case concerning the distribution of videos depicting animal cruelty, the First Amendment protects against the government. It does not leave us at the mercy of noblesse oblige. We would not uphold an unconstitutional statute merely because the government promised to use it responsibly. United States v. Stevens, 559 U.S. 464-80-2010. Idaho's statute cannot be upheld even if the government asserted it would tailor its use of the statute and would not prosecute journalists on, and their sources for engaging in news gathering and dissemination. Ultimately, Idaho's ag, -AG statute is unconstitutional as a content-based restriction not narrowly tailored to serve a compelling state interest. For the foregoing reasons, Amici Curiae respectfully urge the court to uphold the district court's rulings. Respectfully submitted, Bruce D. Brown, Council of Record for Amicus Curiae, Greg Leslie Michael Lambert, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Statement of related cases, undersigned counsel is unaware of any related cases pending in this court. Certificate of compliance pursuant to federal rule at P32A7C and Circuit Rule 321 for case number 1535960. Length limits. Okay, so um, there's a bunch more. Certificate of service, statements of interest. Mm. More um, just sort of, oh, we went kind of a repetition of what was in the beginning of the filing. And then a bunch of oh, contact infos. Um, for all the organizations. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that. And this was heavily cited in the Project Veritas v. Schmidt ruling, and I'm pondering why animals would have more rights than women not to be harassed in the Domestic Violence Agency in Clatsop County or the Soup Kitchen in Clatsop County. And so I'm, I'm pond I have this analogy in my mind between slaughterhouses and how the homeless are treated, which are two huge passions of mine. And the fact that homeless are treated so abysmally, it to me seems strange that we've broken more ground for animals in some regards than for women and homeless people. And uh, we need to get back on a path of human rights. <laughs>